Welcome to the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little bit more about how they wrote it. My name is Zach Powers. I am the artistic director at the Writer Center, but I am also an author. And importantly for this chat, uh, I am a past winner of the Boa Short Fiction Prize. And the book we're talking about today is the current winner of the Boa Short Fiction Prize, or the most recently published winner of the Boa Short Fiction Prize. It is Are We Ever Our Own by Gabrielle Lucille Fuentes. And it's an amazing book, and I'm excited to dive into some talk about the craft of how this book came together. So, uh, Gabrielle, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm really excited. I loved the last event that I did at the Writers' Center with you, and so I'm really glad to be, um, you know, in the virtual community um, mm -hmm. again. So. Well, yeah. Do, do you have your Do you have the, the book handy to do a little reading from? Yeah, just something, just something short, <laughs> so that our audience uh, gets a taste of what we'll be talking about. Also, because I, I love your language and just want to 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 hear it uh, hear it in your actual voice. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm glad. I hope you enjoyed the book. Um, yeah, so I will just read the first couple of paragraphs from the opening, um, uh, the opening story. Um, it's the opening story. It's the beginning of the story, so it doesn't need any explanation. Anna Mendieta haunts the block. Simon Marshall, interning tour guide, art history stands in the empty gravel yard of Donald Judd's museum in Marfa, Texas. The sun dips below the high walls of the compound, illuminating a perfect half of the courtyard. Behind Simon, a wide expanse stretches, interrupted only by Donald's outdoor dining table, still holding two copper pots, as if the artist had just stepped inside to catch a phone call though he's been dead for decades. Simon, having shooed away the final tourist of the day, crosses the courtyard to lock the gates. They rear far above his head, solid wood aged to black and buttressed by iron. He feels medieval whenever he does this. Who else but a feudal lord would need such protection? Tonight, there's a moment of Resistance before the door shuts. A figure, shadowy, blurred around the edges, pushes through him, right through him. At this moment, he thinks not of Anna Mendieta, Cuban American visual and performance artist, enfant terrible of the 1980s New York art scene, who died far too young, her famous artist husband tried and acquitted for her murder. Simon doesn't know Anna yet has never heard of her. Instead, he thinks of Caridad Mendoza, a Marfa high school senior who comes to the museum on Saturdays to help her aunt clean. Last week, he walked in on Caridad reading a bilingual edition of Sor Juana's poems in the bathroom she was supposedly cleaning. He doesn't know why he thinks of Caridad, except that she's coming again tomorrow and he hasn't been able to not think of her all week. Simon reaches for his phone, but it's still daylight, nothing to be afraid of. No crunch of gravel and nowhere in this purposely bleak yard to hide. Instinctively, Simon creeps over to Donald's cement pool, edges sharp enough to crack a skull on and gazes into the algae dark water. But he gets there too early. The reflection of his face, backed by juniper bushes, rises to meet him, nothing more. Anna has entered the block, but she hasn't yet gone for a dip. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love that story so much too. So, yeah. Um, so, just in your own words, as introduction to everyone, who the heck are you? <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm Gabriela Lucio Fuentes. Um, I'm a writer and teacher. I teach at the University of Maryland. Um, I teach creative writing there, which is really fun and um, really. Um, really uh, gives me a lot of gratitude. Um, I am from Wisconsin um, and I grew up in Wisconsin um, and then uh, moved to the East Coast for, um, for school. Um, I come from like a mix, mixed race, myth, mixed ethnicity family. My dad is Afro-Cuban, he's from Cuba. My mom is white, she grew up in, on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Um, and so my, a lot of my writing explores different types of um, hybridity and mixedness, um, 
and uh, um, biculturality, both like, you know, kind of head on um, in realism and also um, in through like sci-fi and fantasy and different metaphors. Great. Oh my gosh, Nina. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One of my students, yeah, it's so cool. Hello, my students, yay. <laughs> All right, so our, no, I got welcome. you so excited to see her. <laughs> <laughs> so our first question is always, well, usually the hardest question. So the first question is, what's a question you really wish someone would ask you about your writing or writing practice? In other words, what haven't you gotten to speak about before? Yeah, it is a hard question, Zach. And you gave me all these wonderful questions. And I was like, that's the first one. And I got to really have an answer for it. Um, I think, you know, one of the things with working with this short story collection is I was really um, inspired by a little, a lot of visual arts practices. Um, and so that, I think for me, one of the things that is often not talked about in writing is how different types of art practices can inform your art practice. Um, and uh, this is something that I make my students talk about a lot, um, actually, um, but I don't actually talk about it very much um, and uh, um, talk, I feel like it's not spoken about, but one of the reasons I, I was looking to all of these visual artists is I was looking for like a way to like break apart writing in a way that felt fruitful and new. Um, and I, I, so I think like, I, yeah, one of the things that I'm still interested in talking about is like how we can learn from other art practices. Great. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And we have to go down that rabbit hole then because I do love the, I do love cross genre inspiration or cross media inspiration as well. And I just realized that the Nina you're talking about was our former intern. So hi Nina, we're excited to see you too. So this is, uh, this is, this is Yay, I, famous Nina. <laughs> I, didn't know which one, I didn't know which Nina was referring to until she responded in the chat there. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in addition to art, are there other other media that you draw from? I mean, film, I mean, there's a one one story here that might mention a little bit later that has even some like screenplay type uh, borrowed form things going on. And so are there other things that inspire you in terms of non writing in terms of art inspiration? Yeah, yeah. So I was drawing for this book, I was drawing on a lot of um, visual artists from like the 60s and 70s in New York. Um, like Anna, Man Anna Mandieta being one of the, the primary um, people like I have the first story in the book is about her, is kind of about her but like her her art practice um, just kind of suffused my my practice um, and her her work is is ephemeral and so for me it was really exciting to think about um, art as like writing is not ephemeral right like um, but to like kind of fuse those two so she did like performance art as well as visual art. So performance art is really interesting to me. And I also did some research um, in buto dancing, which is a type of um, Japanese um, like experimental dance form, um, like came out after the war. Um, and then also I uh, like fell in love with Maya Darren's um, filmmaking. I mean, she was a um, experimental filmmaker. And so one of the stories um, uses like some of her techniques and kind of draws on her her practices, um, um, yeah, that's the one that has the screenplay in it, mm -hmm. um, like notes on a screenplay. And I mean, while I'm throwing curveballs at the beginning with questions I didn't prepare, I'm also interested <laughs> because there are historical figures throughout these stories. I'm wondering what 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 draws you to writing those historical figures into maybe well in the opening one. I, I don't think it's a spoiler that it's a the, the historical figure is a ghost at this point. And, uh, but other historical figures show up. What drew you to these figures? You mentioned the era, but what inspires you about their stories? How does, how did these become the characters in the stories you wrote? Yeah, I mean, I think with the case of Anna Mendieta, like I just fell in love with her work and, you know, she died young um, under these suspicious circumstances. And, um, you know, I was just really angry that she wasn't, uh, able to keep making art um, and so I wanted to like just kind of do something with that anger um, and then some of the other artists like like Donald Judd who the, the the idea with that with the story the first story is it's kind of pairing Donald Judd uh, and Ana Mandieta like kind of as opposites not that they necessarily were but 
Donald Judd, this is really getting into the reads right away. Um, he's, he's a minimalist artist, um, big sculptures of like metal squares, um, very macho, very sort of like, you know, could read a lot of militarism into it. Um, but so I was interested in posing like this artist who makes ephemeral quote unquote feminine or feminist art with like this like guy who's making these giant monster sculptures and making a shit ton of money off of them. Um, so I was interested in kind of like the, the different metaphors that were floating around with these artists as well. Um, and like seeing the role that like minimalism still plays in our culture um, versus like how um, uh, art that's ephemeral is really deprecated, you know, it's uh, really denigrated um, and really looked down upon. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the, the artists were kind of like a way to like get super geeky while hopefully not getting too boring, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so getting to my actual prepared questions now, I, I really <laughs> wanted to start out, and now I won't quite start out, all I get to is is the prose style in general, because I really did love the style of your writing, uh, as I got to geek out as a writer a little bit and like go back through some sentences a few times and just see how they were structured. Um, so, so just broadly, though, what is your prose philosophy? How do you approach words in the page? Um, well, first of all, thank you. I appreciate that, um, especially because for me, like the prose is it's just the number one thing. Like, I don't care what a story is about. It could be about the best thing in the world, but if the prose isn't there, I just, it doesn't quite um, grab me. Um, I, you know, I, I, I read that question and I was like, I have never thought about that. But I think for me, what I'm guided by is wanting my prose to be really beautiful. And I'm, I'm just, I'm really guided by beauty when I write. Um, and even if it's about something awful, like sometimes I think, you know, you, you can't make something beautiful. That's a sort of ethical um, issue is trying to make the really beautiful, the really awful beautiful. But when I first sit down to write, it's, I'm, I'm in a place of, of kind of going towards beauty and going towards what I find pleasurable and lovely and sensual. Um, and I'm inspired a lot by, um, by Spanish writers, writers who write in Spanish, both Spanish and Latin American writers. Um, and for them uh, in Spanish, there's there's less of a um, there's less of a sort of um, uh, fear of the long sentence. You could say like the long sentence is like yeah, that's a sentence. Like sure, there are three semicolons. That's okay. Um, so I'm 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 kind of guided by that too, and you know, <laughs> often helped by editors to kind of. Uh, form that into something a little bit more manageable. But but yeah, I think like, I really like writing that is kind of like, there's a clear voice to it. There's a, a clear, there's a style to it. Like I might move between styles, but I like being like, oh yeah, I can tell that a person wrote this instead of just like a very, very competent robot, you know? Yeah, and I mean, I, I think that I could, like, especially some of the longer sentences, I feel like I could recognize your writing in them, you know, if I read, read that sentence detached, like, I think that's hers. That would be like my reactions. There are a few, it's not, it's not every sentence too, because I don't want to imply yeah. that you're like a, a single long sentence type writer, but yeah, when they come out, they work really well. So how much of your style, speaking of style, emerges in your first draft versus how much is a process of revision to polish into the shape that we see in the finished stories? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, think, and this might not be true for all stories, but I think the, the style comes pretty early, you know, and then it, it is a matter of refining it. But I feel like with the stories that to me are the most successful, I have the tone and the style right away. And that just lands on the page right away. And then it's like, okay, I can take this sentence and clean it up. I can take, I can take, like change the structure. But if I can't get the tone right, then those are often the stories that either they take a really long time or uh, they they just ultimately do not, are not successful. And um, I don't like seek to you know, like have them in the book or seek to have them published. Cause I think it's for me that sort of like, that's almost kind of like the magic is like getting in that sweet spot where like somehow the the voice is holding up a whole world right like because you're trying to create a whole world with your story and for me it's like the the voice that really does that the diction the sentence structure yeah I, I'm, I'm curious now too so you you said you get yeah, this at the beginning but 
I, I'm sort of the same way. So this is sort of a curious question for me. Sometimes though, you know, I'd have bad writing days, but at some point, if the basics of the story is there or the novel or whatever project I'm on, I did learn somewhere along the way that I can force out some writing in a day and it feels terrible. And I'm sure I'm going to go back and hate it. And then that's actually go back and like, oh, that was okay. And that's, I think, sort of what the thing you can learn in writing. You, you that's, the, that's when you learn craft. It's like you fall back on the stuff you know rather than the stuff you feel. Do you have that same sort of experience once you get going at the beginning, at least? Can you force out some prose when you're not necessarily feeling the style intuitively? Yeah, I mean, I, I think sometimes when I kind of get into the groove, I can stay in that groove. It's hard to kind of create a groove, you know, um, but but um, I've, I often find that like a lot of times when I feel like I'm having a bad writing day, it's just that I'm having a bad day. And like it, it actually has nothing to do with my writing. It's just like I'm just feeling negative about myself and, you know, like it's just not that necessary. Um, I think when things feel like I just cannot push this rock up the hill, then I, I revise, you know, I do something else. Um, I have all these kind of like, I write by hand and then I type it up or dictate it. I've started dictation, which is like a very amazing um, step in my life, <laughs> it's ways easier. So I always kind of have something else that I can do if I am in a space where I just can't generate prose, um, yeah. But I sometimes I for me the 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 the, the um, time when I'm generating prose is so compressed compared to the time of revising. Um, like I I just like will write a lot and then spend a long time revising. So yeah yeah I don't know if that makes sense for me. Yeah, it's that, that craft stuff is really like turning the mess you know that kind of came out into um, into something that's that's readable. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like so much of craft is how you revise, not how you write. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I just quick reminder to everyone in the chat, we do do or in the online, go into the chat and give us your questions. I will get to all the questions I can and hopefully all of them. So please ask your questions. I'd much rather jump into the chat window and take yours and keep going down mine. But for the time being, back to mine. Uh, so I, I had a couple more questions on prose and style and, and, and tone. And one of the things I think is really important to talk about is that I think tone can sometimes actually suffer in revision. I think mm -hmm. sometimes uh, you can sort of, in an effort to clean up the prose, you actually just smooth out the quirks that make prose memorable. So what do you look to preserve from early drafts? What are the things that you're like, are there specific things or there feelings or they're just impressions you try to preserve from early drafts through your revision, anything you do consciously to not lose uh, things in revision? Yeah, I feel like that's such a good question because you know, when you're revising, at least for me, my fear is that I'm gonna lose the thing that made it, you know, sort of magical to begin with, that made it something that I wanted to spend the time writing. Um, I um, I don't know, <laughs> cause I, I'm really, I take so long at revising because I'm kind of a, a dainty reviser. Like eventually huge changes are made, but at first I'm like, I can take away that comma, like, you know, um, cause I, I don't want to lose that, um, that sense of, 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 um, you know, sort of spark, but, um, I was reading a, a, a swim in the pond, a swim in the pond in the rain, which is so good. Everyone should read it. The George Saunders craft book. And he was saying that he just goes through his, 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 um, paragraphs, like line by line. And he's like, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad. And like, like his brain has like a lever, you know? And I think that, it, when he said that, I was like, oh yeah, that's what I do. It's like, I'm reading it. And if there's a thing in my brain that's like, that sounds great, then I keep it. And if it's like, that sounds terrible, then I'm like, okay, I will probably eventually have to scrap it. Probably I won't be able to until the next the next revision because um, I'm really bad at killing my darlings, quote unquote. I love them all. They're my little sweeties. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think like it's this sort of instinctual feeling that like, this feels good, this doesn't. Like this is this is pulling the story down. I think we all know what that feels like. We feel it when we read. We feel it when we read our own work. What what do you do? Do you have what do you I mean? Do you have any uh, techniques? One interesting thing is I mean, so my book that won the the, the BOA uh contest, I mean, those stories now, the oldest ones are 15 years old, maybe. And I look at them and like I am so much better at writing and revising now than I was then. 
but then looking at them and trying to see what, I mean, the book got published. The stories, most of them were published individually beforehand. So like I cringe a little bit, but also there must have been content there that was resonating. So it's recognizing the things maybe that resonate in the story. And that isn't, so I'm a much better writer on the sentence level. Like if I look at an old thing, I instantly see things that I didn't see then. It's like, oh, right away, I recognize a page much better than I used to recognize it. But um, I'm actually re revising right now my first unpublished novel and it needs some revision, but also like, I was having fun writing this. There's just like, yeah. I just like, I, I was less aware of uh, publishing world and all the things around it. And I just wrote something that entertained me. And yeah. I think losing that some, so I think that's sort of like it's the, the self-entertainment. You don't want to revise that out. You don't want to turn it into like this pristine thing that is not you because you are not a pristine thing. Not you, me. Um, I'm pristine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, just to stay on that for one second, I, I completely agree with what you're saying because I feel like revision is so important. And I like, I tell my students, you've got to revise, you've got to revise, you've got to spend a lot of time, way more time than you think. But there is a certain point where I think you can just keep rewriting a story, you know, like, cause I'm, the story is never gonna get perfect. And like, if I'm working on it for such a long time that suddenly that I am a new writer, you know, then I have to, I have to like rewrite it. Then that's, at a certain point you have to like, you have to just like cut, cut tails and run, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. All right, so we do have some questions coming in the chat, so I'm going to definitely hit a few of those now. Uh, one is a practical question. Can you tell us more about dictation? I find that so interesting. What system do you use? Do you find that similar to a stage reading where you can tell if the words sound right? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Noreen. That's a great question. Um, yeah, my friend just was like, Gabrielle, you're complaining about, you know, having to type up your stories. Just use dictation. So I just use what's on Microsoft Word on my computer. Um, I'm sure there's a better one. I don't uh, know. Um, it it can it the process of typing up the work or dictating the work is really helpful um, because it's it's just a huge oh like editing overhaul. It the way that the system that I use works, it's much more broken up than a reading would be. So the um, it you can only do kind of like clause at a time, clause at a time. Um, but I do later on in the revision read everything aloud, um, and I I kind of read aloud throughout too, like little parts, maybe not the whole story, but I read aloud throughout. Um, so that that is that is a big part of the um, my process. Yeah, and I I I will second that. I mean, I read aloud every like a novel. I will read aloud at least three times the entire novel short stories yeah. maybe even more because you can just go back and back and back so i'll just read short stories i can just like until that sounds like a song i don't want to really stop sometimes so yeah i've never tried yeah. dictation but that's an interesting side effect of using dictation is you get that sort of early stage out loud reading because that's usually pretty late for me too that's usually when i'm feeling yeah. pretty close to done so getting that at a much earlier part would be interesting yeah all right three-part question do you outline before you write and have you ever written out a story outline then not liked it, didn't think it would make a good story? And how did you handle that? Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, I usually don't outline, um, you know, uh, especially with a story. Um, I kind of have like an opening image and then I often have a closing image or I kind of have a sense of where it's gonna go. Um, I've been writing kind of longer stories like in the 30, 40 page range. And with those, I can like, I'll like get midway through and I'll be like, I don't know how this is gonna, like, I don't know what's like how I'm gonna work it out. So I'll make some notes, but I've I've never ever in my life like been like starting with an outline and then filling that in. Um, I, to me, it feels like a five paragraph essay or something, you know, I know people do it and they love it and it works really well for them. But for me, I'm just like, no. Um, for me, it's like kind of the excitement of not knowing how I'm going to get there or where it's going to go um, that I'm drawn to. Um, and a lot of the places where I've actually with bigger projects that I've gotten stuck is when I do like I get two thirds in, then I outline it to get to the end. And then I just uh, like George R. R. Martin it and can't get there. Like, I'm just like, nope. <laughs> no way it's not happening um because I think for me yeah it, it just 
it kind of takes the air out a little bit. But I also write stories that are really don't are not hinged on like really complex narratives, you know, like like a something where you really need to outline it, you know. So I'm not dissing outlines just for myself. Yeah. So this is a related question, and I might add something to it. So the question was, do you see the end of your story when you start it? But also, if not, where does the end come from? So it's always like interesting to me because I am not a know the end of a story when I started person. Yeah, I mean, with with most of the stories in this book um, and most most of my shorter short stories, I am kind of working towards a final like image or like a sort of feeling. Um, but I don't necessarily know how the plot is going to get there and how the characters might change or um, or uh, yeah, change or shift or or act while getting there. Um, yeah, and even with um, with the, the novels uh, that I've worked on or written, um, I have I've often had like that kind of final line or final image. But then it's like, yeah, how do we get there? Is sort of the the, the winding path. Great. Um, another question and. So speaking of revising, I'd like to hear from others how often they revise, like I'll write a lot and then go back and revise or write a bit and revise shorter parts of a larger piece. Um, if any, uh, so uh, Gabrielle, you wanna answer that, but if anyone else has any feedback on that, that would probably be helpful as well, because I think it's, I think this one's good to hear that there's about a billion different techniques. So uh, w w what's yours? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I know we're always like revise, revise, and then but revising is such a black box. Um, I, I write up the story by hand, then I type or dictate it onto the computer, and then I um, print it out and I read it, partially reading aloud, editing. Um, so I really, I don't start editing until I have a full draft of a story. Um, and and with, with uh, novels I've worked on, I would say I maybe I had I would have big chunks before I started editing, like maybe 50 paragraphs, um, paragraphs, pages, 50 pages. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I really have to kind of see it before I can start editing. Um, yeah, yeah. Does that answer that question? <laughs> no, I believe so, yeah. And I, okay. I'm, I, I'm the same way. I don't, I mean, even novels, I mean, you have to go back sometimes to remind yourself of something. If I notice, some, I'll fix something. If I notice it or a new idea comes, I'm not, I'll go back. But generally, I don't. I don't do a formal revision process. I'm not revising. That's not my mindset until the thing is done. Then it's like, I got to get the first part of it done. I have to get the thing done in some format before I want to go back and fix it. Otherwise, it's like, I can fix this piece of the car, but it's not going to help me much unless I have the entire car. Because I yeah. feel like, yeah. I think, you know, I think sometimes with novels, I think, yeah, uh, I, I did have a couple of times where I was like, I'm stuck. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got was from Stephen Graham Jones. And he's like, if you're stuck or the ending isn't working, it's because of something that happened like five pages before, 10 pages before, 20 pages before. So sometimes it that is helpful to go back and just see what's happening. Like, um, but I, I really do think you have to have a big chunk, you know, to work with to do that. Yeah. It's, an, it's interesting, I almost don't feel like, I guess that is technically revision. But I don't think I did that my, my revision brain isn't on at that point. Like it's yeah. two very separate mindsets. And even though mm -hmm. that is a form of fixing, I'm like, I'm not thinking of like making this thing work as best it can. It's like that's still a process of getting to the end. It's still like, oh, I got to go back this way a little bit to make sure I can get to the end. It's a little backtrack more than anyway. We're talking semantics here probably, but it's interesting no, how but, my mind works. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like I think there's the generating process, there's the totally revising process. And then there's this definite middle ground, right? Where you're like adding new words, but then changing a little bit and like, you know, having to go back in order to go forward. Like it's not, I don't think it's that so like, you know, divided as we often talk about it, you know? Yeah, I, there was another question direct message me in the chat and it was the difference between editing and revising. It may just be a comment that we may be talking about the difference between editing and revising. Yeah. Uh, and you know, those words are somewhat interchangeable, but. I guess revision is a process for me and editing is sometimes a task, if that makes makes sense. Um, yeah. Editing is like, I, I think of it as like cleaning up the final draft, yeah. whereas revision is like, you know, there's nothing clean about it. You're like in the muck, you know, with like shovels and getting attacked by snakes. 
Yes, I'm not, I'm not sure when this question came through, so it, it's, a, it's a little broad, but let's see how it goes, which is how much is emotional intelligence versus infrastructure? Um, I wonder, I, I feel like I saw when that came up because I, I don't quite know, um, like, it, does it mean, I feel like, it, like, do they mean like in terms of, um, maybe, maybe in terms of outlining, I mean, uh, like yeah. just kind of the outlining area, like how much is just having a emotional sense of what's working versus building an intricate infrastructure. And Yvette, yeah. if you want to, to say anything more about that, please put more in the chat and we'll definitely, if we're missing the point here, we'll definitely come back to it and, and try to get on target. Okay. But yeah. So, okay, That's cool. Correct. Yeah. 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 I think for me, I really do rely a lot on sort of that sort of in, instinctual emotional intelligence, like uh, stuff. I'm, I'm not really thinking about it. I'm not really planning it out, but that comes from, you know, decades of reading, reading a lot of critical work ab about, um, like I, I, I have a PhD in English, so I have read a lot of critical work about the English language and English literature. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I've read it. Um, so, you know, I think that there is a lot of infrastructure. I'm just, it's just inside of me at this point. It's like become my in, emotional intelligence. Um, I, I don't map out things too much. Um, but I do kind of rely on, does this feel right? Does it not feel right? Um, yeah. And that's, that's just kind of how, yeah, how I work, I think. Great. Uh, another question from the chat. Uh, Ernesto asks, are you fluent in Spanish? If so, how does it change your writing? Have you ever written in Spanish? Yeah. Um, nice. Good question. Yeah. My Spanish is okay. I wish it was better. Um, my dad um, is from Cuba, but he uh, did not grow up speaking Spanish in the house. So I did not grow up speaking Spanish in the house with them. So I've studied Spanish um, and, I, you know, I'm okay. In college, I was really good. And I was like reading like Marquez in Spanish. Um, and that was when I started writing. So I think it did really influence me. Um, and just kind of being around the language, um, you know, growing up when I would go see my family wanting to be around the language like having it feel like this is a part of me that i don't necessarily have full access to but i want access to it i think is a big part of my um kind of identity as a writer um but yeah like i said before um the even just the grammatical structure of spanish with the long like the long sentences um uh sometimes you know there's there's fewer words in spanish than there are in english um, and that kind of, I think, changes things as well. Um, those, those have definitely shaped my style in a big way. Um, cause I really, I started writing when I was studying Spanish, then when I went to Spain, um, and, and a lot of what I write about draws on, um, Cuban history, Latin American history, Spanish history. Uh, question from Nina, um, our, our favorite student slash intern. Um, do you ever struggle with writer's block? What do you do when you know you want to write or have part of an idea, but don't know where to start? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I used to say I didn't start, struggle with writer's block, and then there was the pandemic, and then it's like... Ruined everything. <laughs> ruined everything. Um, I think just start with what you have. Start with the part of the idea. Like, I, I usually start with an image, um, or like, I'm like, a, a character or a feeling or a, a you know scrap of dialogue. I think you really don't have to know where you're going to just start. Um, and I think what usually happens is once you start, you realize you know a lot more than you thought you did. And the act of writing, because it's a creative act, it generates more prose, you know, like it it like it's like bunnies, you know, it just kind of it kind of keeps multiplying. Um, but I think when, if you're struggling with writer's block, you know, one of the things I think is helpful is, is to read um, and to read, like, like Zach was saying, to read poetry um, and, be, and just enjoy how wonderful it is and how much you can do with so few words. Um, but yeah, to read and then also to just give yourself like little writing exercises, you know, um, it's just like say, okay, let's try to write a hundred words, you know, try to write 50 words or to journal 
um, to write about what you're reading, just to kind of start writing and you just kind of trick yourself and then all of a sudden you're writing what you want to be writing, I think. I think that too. It's Do you have any tricks? Like, yeah. I, would, I was just from what you said, I was just thinking that's like an interesting way, like move away from the thing you're trying to finish to just writing something. And if you don't, yeah. I mean, you still put words in the page, you've still, it's a practice. So if you're practicing every day, whether or not it's going towards a, it's hard to get away from that finished product for me sometimes. Like we're not actually actively working towards something that will exist as a completed object, a literary object at least, then it's hard for me to to want to work on it. But I should probably, maybe that's the way to do it. Just just write something. I've never been a journaler. I never have, I'm not, that's never been me. I've just always been, I'm working on a project or I'm not writing. And maybe I need to allow myself to put random thoughts down and not try to have them come to some sort of conclusion. Yeah, um, I mean, I they, oh, sorry, just to uh, finish, uh, go off of that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's just so many different ways to do it, you know? And like, for me, one of the things that I struggle with is when I am writing a novel, it seems so, um, oh God, it's impossible. How can I write 300 pages? I'll never be able to do it. So I have to do the opposite and like trick myself and be like, I'm not writing a novel. I'm just writing this scene. Yeah, here's this scene and here are these characters and just be like, okay, just write one page in that. Um, and it often ends up being more. The only problem with that is then sometimes you have a lot of scenes that like don't go in the novel, but that's okay. I think that happens to everyone. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like a lot of the times I hear people's like writer's block advice is about tricking yourself. It's, it's, you just have to have to trick yourself into doing something. And that's yeah. sort of that's I feel like that's like 90 percent of writer writer's block advice boils down to just trick yourself. Just just. Yeah. Because your brain doesn't yeah. like, yeah, you're like reptile brain. It just it doesn't want to write. Writing is too hard. It would be better to like read in bed with like snacks. You know, like, and you can fail at writing and it means a lot to you. So it's it's scary, right? So you do, I think, at least I do have to trick myself to be like, no, we're just, we're just gonna go over here for a minute. You know, it's like you're, jo you, if you wanna go jogging, I just like, I'm like, I'm just putting on my shoes. I'm just moving towards the door. I'm not gonna go on a little run. I'm just slowly getting out the door, you know? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, so, so one thing that was, I was curious about just reading your work is is influences in your writing. And first of all, I had forgotten that you had a PhD, which is obviously you've read a lot of things that probably a lot of things that I've avoided my entire life. Um, and you've mentioned then to also reading things in Spanish language authors. So um, you there's a couple influences right there. But what I, I'm curious about your like literary heritage in general, and especially the things you consider as the authors and the books that have most influenced your work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's just a lot of people, you know, like just so many people. Um, but, you know, for the for this collection, I think like um, Christina Garcia was really important. Um, uh, Laird Hunt is a big influence mm -hmm. on me. Um, like, you know, the big guns, like, you know, like um, uh, Marquez, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin are like, they're really, really huge um, influences for me. Um, but I also do just kind of try to read really broadly. Um, and so I read like, I really love contemporary Japanese fiction. Um, so I love like Yoko Tawada and the name is Amura. Um, I also um, really love, uh, I love Coffee House Press in general, like any of their books. I'm like, yes. So Sila Satterstrom, that's also a big, a big influence for me. I'm just like looking at my book, my bookshelf right now. <laughs> um, I mean, I think like the thing with this collection is it came together over a while. Um, and uh, I was reading a lot while I was writing most of this while I was in school. I was reading so much. Um, and so there's just so many influences here. Um, but those are, I think those are some of the big ones. I know I'm missing some. Alex Chi, Alexander Chi is a really big influence for me. Hmm. Um, I can see that one for sure. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, yeah. But, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of things that really influenced this book. But yeah, like some older, older works, like um, there's this book, which is kind of terrible, um, called Cecilia Valdez by Sirio um, Verde which is like the national novel of Cuba. And it's like a melodrama, but I read a lot of melodrama and kind of like enjoyed just like the way plot worked there. 
um, and and just kind of being like, now we're over here, and this person is dying of love, and you know, the, I I enjoyed that sort of stuff too. It's like um, these like move basically moves that are not acceptable now, um, but but I think are still still have some weight to them. And you, you mentioned Marquez, and I definitely saw the Marquez influence in there, but it se that seemed like too big and obvious one for me to say, so I didn't want to say it, but you brought it up, so I could. Like, I definitely saw Marquez in, in the writing as well. Um, yeah. So just a reminder, we have we're, we're have another 15 minutes or so. If you have any more questions for the chat, please put them in there and I will ask them. Uh, in the meantime, I want to talk a little bit about scenic writing, because I am a giant sucker for for stories that happen mostly in scene, and I think a lot of these function in that way. I think it's, uh, 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 I don't say it's a hard way to write because I do it because that would be cocky on my part if I said it was hard. It's a very easy way to write, um, but it's, you don't find it all, always. And there's amazing writers that write mostly in exposition. Um, I mean, I always reference like, like you get to the the last like two thirds of Colson Whitehead's Underground Railroad happens almost entirely in exposition. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I but I love scene, so I really wanted to ask you about scenic writing a little bit. So where do your scenes come from? How do you find them? You mentioned sometimes just writing a scene when you're feeling stuck as opposed to worrying about where it goes. So how do you recognize the scene ideas that will work or at least lead to their own completion? Yeah, that's such a good story. Uh, such a good question because I I read it and I was like, really? Oh, no, that's true. Yeah, I, I do write in scene. Honestly, part of it is was the the terror of oh sorry my dog's barking no, oh Bonna, dog. my little dog um was the terror of like show don't tell right can't tell ever um and so I thought you just couldn't even though obviously most books like before 1950 were just all telling um hello my dog has decided to join us um but um, yeah, so that's part of it, as I think I was a little afraid to tell. But then the other part is I um, I studied theater, um, uh, like you know, up until I graduated from undergrad, I was I was going to be an actor. I was like, I'm gonna you know go to New York or LA. I'm gonna be an actor. Um, and so I really I really came to writing through the theater, like through thinking about characters like on stage. And um, you know, theaters, the you know, plays happen in scenes, right? Um, there's very little room for exposition, um, and so I really like some of my first stories are just like talking and then blocking, like like characters are in dialogue and then they move across the room. Um, so yeah, um, so that's I think I really came from that space of um, you know thinking about. Um, how characters are interacting with each other. So I think I think the way I, I start thinking about a, a scene is like how a body is moving through space and interacting with the other bodies around it. Um, and is that like a dynamic interaction or not? Like what's fraught about that interaction? That's kind of what what you know. I would never say it that way, but when I kind of examine it, that's that's I think what's going on. Yeah, I think did that, case, is that, did that answer it? No, absolutely. I mean, and similarly in my case, you, you said the theater background. I mean, I was before, I mean, in terms of like narrative influences, I was watching movies and binging, you know, obsessing over TV shows before you could binge them on Netflix. So I certainly like, I feel like that's probably where I'm coming from some way, some too, like in my head, a scene is probably always taking place on a screen um, mm. as opposed to uh, in the real world, maybe in some way. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. And I feel like that's that's especially more and more true as we watch more, more as we spend more of our time watching shows yes. and, and, and movies and stuff. Like I think a lot of like my students, it's definitely like like the, the they think in, in terms of that. And I, I find myself doing that more and more, but I didn't used to. Like I used to like think of the narrator as like on the stage and the like world moving around her. Um, and sometimes when I think of the world flat like a screen, it kind of, it to me it kind of wrecks it because something times I want something to happen that isn't necessarily filmable, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking on the other direction, though, because I mean we're talking about writing and scene, but exposition happens in any written scene. There's going to be exposition, but how does what makes exposition work? What's it? What makes it 
not clunky? What makes it interesting rather than explainy? I mean, I think it has to be the way that it's written, right? Like it has to be like like joyfully and pleasurably, pleasurably or like weirdly written. Um, like I, I've been reading a lot of Ursula K. Le Guin and she, it's just exposition for chapter on chapter, but it's beautifully written. And it's also about weird things that are actually hold your attention. So I think with exposition, it's just the stakes are higher for the prose to be good and for the thing to be interesting. Um, and that's just straight exposition. Like obviously there are ways to blend scene and exposition um, that kind of like allow that you know, you to kind of bear the weight of exposition a little bit easier. Um, but I, you know, I do love if, if somebody has like an interesting world or social situation or a story that they're they're telling, I love to hear it. Like I, I like to, to read good exposition. I think there's a real bias about it in this, you know, in like the US literary market right now. Um, but it's, you know, it's definitely the tool of like, so many great writers all over the world, you know? Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's just a, having a sense of vibrancy, you know, to the prose. And then also like, you can really tell if something is interesting or not, if the exposition is interesting or not, right? Yeah, yeah Because like absolutely. dialogue is action, it's interesting. Like it's already interesting, right? People doing things, you're in the moment, that's interesting. Um, but if the narration and the exposition is boring, you're like, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I think I'm thinking of Karen Russell right now and the fact that I would pretty much let Karen Russell explain anything to me in her prose style because it's such a rich and complicated, complicated, not in a, I don't know, that's not the right word, but just engaging, lush, mind-blowing, original prose style that she'll be explaining the weirdest scenario and you're like, okay, these are beautiful words, keep them coming. And, and you're still covering the weird thing that whoever's going on in one of her stories. So uh, absolutely, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Um, I did want to, uh, we have a little bit of time left and I have plenty of questions left. I wanted to jump ahead a little bit is, uh, I assumed you worked with Peter Connor at BOA as the editor for this story collection. And I have also worked with Peter when, when my story collection came out. So we have some shared editorial experience and that's pretty rare yeah. to have an author that you get to talk with in public who's gone, who's not just gone through editing, but gone through editing with the same person. So how was your, the editorial process for you working with Peter and Boa, uh, especially since you've also published previously compared to the other things you published and how that editorial process went. Yeah, I mean, it was great. Like Boa is, they're wonderful. You know, I've loved them as a press for years. And so I was really happy when they decided to take the book, it was just great. Um, yeah, and Peter is really great. He, um, you know, they, they have a small staff and they do so much. Um, yeah, so it was, it, it was it was interesting because it was definitely more you know it's a small press um and my first book was out um on like on, on a division of simon and schuster um and so with boa it was much more hands-off you know like the the editing not hands-off that isn't the right word um they edited it they edited it the way i think a poem poetry collection is usually edited as in like there's not much editing right like like um, Peter gave a lot of line edits. He had a few questions about like clarifying certain things, but it really was like, he was like, no, the book is good. And I'm like, oh, I'm still, I'm still revising here. And he's like, you need to stop. And I'm like, I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> um, and so that, I'm like, that was one of the things is I was just like, I'm a perfectionist. I, um, I, you know, the longer the, the space between something being accepted and something being published, the more edits I'm gonna try to get in. Um, Cause I'll like wake up in the middle of the night and be like, that's not how you spell yucca. Um, you know, and I'm just like, <laughs> have to like run to the computer. Um, so yeah, so it, because I think because it was a small press maybe just because of his style, it there wasn't the sort of like, sort of deep revisions I was doing with my first book. Cause with my first book or thinking with my editor, it was much more like structural revisions, adding new scenes, um, you know, no, no changes that I, you know, was against, only changes that made the book a lot better, but still pretty big changes. So that was a pretty big difference, I felt like. Was that, was that, did you have a similar experience? Yeah, it was, it was fairly minor. Uh, I remember he called me in the middle of a work day and I had to leave my office and go to a hotel and sit in the hotel lobby. I didn't have headphones, just so like my phone up trying to scribble my other, like take notes as I held the phone, my cell phone in my ear, like, 
you know, in this really uncomfortable place and got all the notes. Yeah, and it was an easy process. There was nothing hugely significant. Um, I, so there was one sentence I agreed to change and I regret it because I like the original sentence better. And uh, that's my my one, th was there anything that you changed in the editorial process with this one or something else that you wish you hadn't after the fact? I'm I'm in super easy going. I'm not precious about my writing. So like, <laughs> sure, that sounds great. That's usually my response. And I did that one time too many. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's this one line in one of the stories that like it ended the story and sometimes I'd take it out, sometimes I'd put it in, sometimes I'd take it out. And in the book, it's not there. And I don't know, maybe it's better without it. I'm a little sad it's not there, but it is in an online version of the story. So I'm like, okay, I can actually have it both ways. Um, but I, I think like with that, I think it's partially just because the story, it's the screenplay story which is a sort of like formally experimental and sort of the story is purposefully, it functions as a rough draft. So there's no way to kind of actually perfect it, like if that makes any sense. Um, so I think it kind of reflects the form too, but I do kind of like that final line. So if you wanna, you, yeah, it's like there's the, the final line is on um, Strange Horizons on where it was published. So okay. yeah. I'm kind of, I don't know, but, but the other without it is good too. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of questions in the chat here, maybe to wrap us up. Uh, so uh, this, this is, I think, piggybacking on some of what we talked about earlier, which is, do you develop the structure before writing or create the foundation as you go along? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, we, we were talking about outlining before, and I think maybe if there, I don't outline, but I do decide the form if I'm, so some of the stories are written in like very visible forms, like uh, letters or a screenplay, um, uh, um, like there's a survey. Um, so I do decide the form beforehand and then, um, and then uh, work around that. Um, so that, that, yeah, I, I do that. Um, so that's kind of, and then, and then the edits are like, how can it match the form where where does the form need to break? Where do I need to discard the form? But that's it, you know, that's sort of the structure that I lay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and and you said referring to the eight point arc. I'm assuming that's I don't know the exact. I'm assuming that's the story arc and maybe the hit points you're supposed to make on the story arc. I've never actually heard the term eight point arc, so I don't know that one exactly. Um, if I you don't want to know. Yeah, me neither. I don't if know. If you want to elaborate, we will try to answer that question. But you've introduced something yeah. we you know more than we do. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, this other question in the chat, though, I, I do want to hit before wrapping up, which is, what was your process in understanding your relationship to Cuba and its history in the Cuban diaspora, and what did you want to convey about that experience? Yeah, um, big question. <laughs> um, I had to write a book about it, and there'll probably be more books about it. Um, I, I was, you know, um, I think a lot of what I was writing about was kind of negotiating these different layers of separation and the different layers of separation that happen with refugees, with exiles, um, you know, um, because Cuba is unique in, um, in terms of a lot of Latin American countries, not all, but that, you know, for a long time one couldn't return. Um, and so there was this separation that, for me, that's what literature is for, is like to like fill in these gaps. Um, and so I, there's this really amazing book by Ada Ferreira, Ada Ferrer, called Cuba and American History, um, which looks at the history of Cuba as an as like um, in connection to the United States. Um, and to me, Cuba is like a way of understanding like all of Latin America and the United States. Not that it's the center of the world at all, but it's a little microcosm. It's not the center of the world, even though some Cubans think it is. Um, it's, it's, it's a microcosm for understanding the history of the United States. And so I think in a way, it's also a way of understanding like mixed identity, um, you know, like bicultural identity, um, like the pain of passing and separation and assimilation. Um, and so I found that a lot of times I felt there was a real lack for me, like I'm not close, I'm not connected. But I realized the more I wrote and the realized the more I investigated these things is that's actually a honest and authentic um, description of what it means to have this heritage is to feel that lack. So I was explaining that, I was exploring that as well. 
Uh, we have a clarification of the eight-point arc, which I'd also Googled while you were talking, so I, I had found it. Um, so it, it's, it, it is the standard arc that I think I'm familiar with, with a few extra uh, hit points along the way. So uh, status, trigger, quest, surprise, critical choice, climax, reversal, and resolution. So uh, I never go nearly that much in my pre-planning. Uh, I often draw an arc and will like jot, make a mark where I think a scene might happen, but that's about the extent of me me structuring yeah i don't i don't yeah i don't i don't plan that out though i do think a lot of my stories do follow that arc but i'm i am also interested in different types of story shapes too you know in stories that um have different types of uh shapes yeah absolutely all right well we have time for our final question and our final question is usually what's one piece of advice you'd give to a writer just starting out um, yeah, so I always say, um, really, in order to write, you just need to write, <laughs> you need to read and read broadly. Um, and I think that more and more, I used to say that's all you need, but I think more and more, I think you also need a community, you know, um, of uh, people, and it might just be one or two people, but but having people around you that you're in contact with either by email or in person um, that also write and read and like like validate you and say this is a good thing for you to be doing. I think those are those are really important things. And and I would say like if you don't have a writing group right now, just like email two people and start one. Um, and it it's having a writing group is like the best thing in the world. All wonderful advice. Uh, Gabrielle, thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, please get a copy of the book if you're able. It's available from uh, your local independent bookseller or directly from the publisher with the link back in the chat window. If you can't buy it, go to your library as well. And if they don't have it, ask them to get it. That's also a great, great, great way to support writers and libraries are awesome. So we want to support them as well. Gabrielle, thank you so much. This has been uh, a delightful chat. I've, I, I feel like I learned things. I feel like I thought about new things and that's always nice. If I feel that way, I'm hoping everyone who came and, and joined us this evening felt that way as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Zach. And thank you so much, everyone for, who put the um, talk up and all for everybody's really great questions. They were really smart and engaging and I really enjoyed them. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.